morning. Good morning, and thank you so much for being here. So my name is Danilo, and I'm an evangelist in Amazon Web Services. And my biggest three passions are serverless, machine learning, and IoT and edge computing. And the reason I'm here is because I think as developers, we talk a lot about web frameworks, about programming languages, but I think we don't talk enough about algorithms. And I, I had this thought on the back of my mind as I was working in the British Library in London when I saw this letter. And this letter caught my attention. This is a, a letter from Ada Lovelace to Charles Babbage. It's from 150 years ago. And this is probably the first time we see in writing the idea of a computer program. It's the idea that we can maybe create a machine, an engine, that can do computation that has not been done before by a human. I, I think this is quite interesting. And Ada Lovelace, she had an incredible life. She was the daughter of Lord Byron, poet and dandy. And uh, her mother was scared that she would become a poet. So she focused her teaching on mathematics and physics, and she became a great mathematician and collaborated with Babbage in the creation of the first mechanical computers, and especially the first general purpose mechanical computers, that's the analytical machine. Uh, actually, uh, Babbage didn't manage to, to, to build it during his lifetime. This was rebuilt 100 years afterwards, but now we can see it in its beauty. And if we see the concept of this machine are similar to those of a modern computer. So we have like working memories, variables, and actually Ada Lovelace was working on the machine, and she also translated an article from an Italian mathematician, Luigi Menabrea, that later on was also one of the first prime minister of unified Italy. And during this translation, she started to add notes. And this is one of the notes that she added, that it's probably the first written computer program that was ever uh, done by a human. And if we can see if, we see, if you have a look, we can see there are a list of steps. This is to compute Bernoulli numbers, so something not quite specific. But we see a, a list of steps. We see working variables. We see how to manage the result for the next step. It's really a computer program for the analytical machine. But actually, algorithms are older than this. And the reason why we use algorithms actually comes from this Persian scholar. This lived more than 1,000 years ago. He lived and he wrote lots of books. And when uh, three, four hundred years afterwards, they were translated uh, to Latin, his name, al Khawarizmi, was Latinized into algorithmi. And now we say algorithmi every time. But algorithms are even older than that. And if we go uh, back to ancient Greece, we see that probably one of the first examples is Euclid's algorithm uh, to compute the greatest uh, uh, common divisor between two numbers. And this is really written as we have to use to, to build a computer program because we have like two variables. We look at the numbers, we take the greatest of the two, we subtract the smaller one, and then we look at the greatest of the two, and we subtract the smaller one, and then we get the final result, the greatest common uh, divisor. And actually, to find that definition of algorithms, I, fi I found this one that is really interesting. It's from the BBC Bite Sides uh, online training. It's a training for young kids for primary schools. And this is saying something that is really interesting. It's saying, uh, you use code to tell a computer what to do. Before you write code, <laughs> you need an algorithm. And an algorithm is a list of rules that you need to follow to build uh, the computer program. And when I saw this definition, I started thinking, well, maybe when I actually develop something, I'm just translating an algorithm into a programming language. I'm just a translator. Actually, it's more than that when we create a program. Uh, if we move into the domain of machine learning, this is Pedro Domingos. He's the author of uh, The Master Algorithm. The Master Algorithm is a fascinating book on the quest for the ultimate learning machine. And he says that the future will be for individuals, for developers, for companies, on those that will understand algorithms better, deeper, and can use them in the, in the best way. So it's, it's really where the important things are, are happening now. And uh, Pedro Domingos is dividing the, 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 the algorithms of machine learning into five tribes, depending if you come from biology, so you probably do with neuroscience, you do neural networks and backpropagation, if you come from statistics and Bayesian uh, rules, if you come from psychology, logic, and so on. And if you want to learn new algorithms in machine learning, probably the first one that you should understand is linear models and the linear learner. Linear models is the way we can predict either a numeric variable or we can do binary classification. So we can predict, for example, with a regression, the number of people that is coming to code motion today, based maybe on the history of the event and the registration, or we can classify an email if it's uh, a spam email or not. 
And let's try to do something together. So let's try to build a, a, a prediction for a, a bike sharing in a town. So how many bikes are rented in any given day in a town? So if we have lots of data in the past, then we can start to think about the future. So what's going to happen uh, on, a, on, a, on a new date, on a new data point that we still don't have? And to do that, we do something that is called supervised learning. So that means that we have lots of labeled data, and then we want to find out one of the, uh, the label for a new data point. And in this case, before feeding all this data to an algorithm, we should start to look at the data and understand if there's some hidden meaning here that it's easy for us, but not for a machine. For example, date and time are so easy for now, but they have lots of hidden meaning. For example, we can replace date and time with something that is more easily uh, to understand for a machine. So for example, from a date, we can understand if it's a Saturday or a Sunday. So the workday is very important because the way I use public transportation is different on a weekend or in a working day. And also if it's a public holiday. So April the 1st and the 2nd that were there were Easter and Mo uh, Easter Monday. So Easter Monday is quite a different Monday from normal Monday days for traffic. So you need to extract this information. This is called feature engineering. So before taking numbers and feeding the numbers to an algorithm, always think there is a hidden value, something that is obvious for me, but not for a machine. Otherwise, the, 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 you, you are just wasting computer cycle to try to extract this information. And then when we build a linear model, we, uh, we add linearly. So we, there is an addition of uh, of things, but this addition is going through basis functions. So we don't we don't need to take the the, res the, the information that we have, so the number of bikes, the date, the time, uh, as they are. We can process this with basis functions. So uh, one thing that I see lots of people is missing is that linear model can process the information through nonlinear functions. So you can build very complex linear models using this very basic trick. And uh, when you have the data, so you're doing supervised learning, uh, you can compare the result of what you're doing with the data you have. Normally, you should split your data in 80% for training and 20% you use for validation. And then you can uh, create some way to measure the error, so the distance from the prediction that you create to the value that are in the validation set. And this distance is, is normally a positive number because you have a distance that mathematically, and uh, even for not mathematical chance, is so always positive from something. And since it's positive, uh, we can try to, to optimize and reduce it. Actually, the more generic concept here that you should use, and this is quite generic for supervised learning, not only for linear models, is the idea of defining your objective function. So the objective function is a sum of two terms. One is the loss, the loss function. The loss function is in the measuring the error of your prediction. Uh, but also, uh, are, uh, you should add a regularization term. The regularization term is measuring the complexity of your model. This is because if you create a model that is too complex, there is the risk of overfitting. And let's see uh, an example. Let's imagine that this is the user interest in, a, in some product uh, over time. And we can see that it's growing over time. You can start and create this model that is probably giving a, a, a big error on the loss function because it's not fitting the data very well. So probably you should train more and reduce the, the, the loss function. And then you get this model. This model is almost a perfect fit for the data, but it's very complex. I'm really understanding what is happening here, or, or I'm just trying to fit the data without understanding. Probably the best model is this one, that is a good balance between reducing the loss function, the error, and also reducing the complexity of the model. And intuitively, we can think that something happened to this user at some point in time, and his interest in this product increased. Maybe he watched an advertisement, or he saw this item uh, at a friend's house, and then he got interested. So simple models work better than complex models. Think of this balance. And when we create this, uh, uh, this uh, objective function, this is again defined to be positive, the idea is to find the minimum, because when we minimize this function, then we can find uh, the, the good compromise. And uh, to do that, we use the gradient. So the grad because this is a multidimensional uh, function. So in, uh, in high school, we studied the, the, the derivative. So the derivative is for one dimension. The gradient is the extension to multiple dimensions. And normally, it's, it's a vector that tells us the direction the function is growing. So if we take the opposite direction, we start descending the gradient. And if we do that in steps, that's called stochastic gradient descent. And we reach one of the minimum. Problem is that and there's lots of optimization here that you should try to find the global minimum, not one of the other minimums that you can have. So it depends on how you build the error or objective function. It depends on how you navigate the function. But that's where lots of optimizations are. 
But linear models are not for everything. For example, uh, uh, in the uh, 2008, 2009, Netflix launched a prize for people to uh, improve their recommendation algorithms, and they were giving away one million of dollars if you would be able to create a better recommendation algorithm than theirs. And the reason is that linear models don't work very well for uh, recommendations. Uh, and uh, the reason why I is that, and then that's the reason why uh, around 2010 we start to see factorization machines, is because uh, uh, when you create a table, a matrix of the user and the item, uh, there's a lot of holes. So because think of Netflix, they, they have probably millions of users, they have probably tens or hundreds of thousands of items. No user has watched all the movies. Is anyone here that saw like 90% of the catalog of Netflix? It's impossible. So there are lots of holes. And mathematically, we, see, we, say, we say that this matrix is sparse. And when you have a sparse matrix and you try to do a linear fitting, this doesn't work because there are too many holes. So mathematics is also telling us that a sparse matrix is easy to factorize, and we can create two smaller matrix that can be multiplied to create the, 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 the bigger one. And these matrix are more, uh, are more dense. Uh, so the idea of uh, factorization machines is that we start with the linear model, and then we add this term. And this term is actually giving a, a, a assigning a vector to every item. So imagine for every movie of Netflix, you have a vector. And then when we compare this item with another item, we, we do the dot product, uh, the scalar product of the two vectors. And it's this way uh, we, we create a new, uh, uh, an additional item that takes care of the relationship among different objects. Uh, this is actually more complex to train because now we have more parameters. And that's why we usually don't use gradient descent here, but we use what is called alternative least square. That means that we uh, alternate. We fix V and then uh, we minimize for W, then we fix W and we minimize for V and then so on. So alternating, we can use traditional approach even if you have lots of more variables. And here we have uh, a new parameters, it's called K and it's the size of those vectors, and it's the number of features that we are analyzing when we want to compare different movies or different items. For example, if we take k equal 4, this is an example of the four vectors that we can get, the four values for vectors that we can get for movies. So we can say, uh, the I have four features. Uh, k is a number that you have to define. How many features do you need to describe an item? Uh, we the only thing that we know is that if k is very big, this algorithm doesn't work. So you should find a smaller value. And if we take four, we can interpret this like the first value is telling me how much a movie is an action movie or a romantic movie or a thriller. Is there, are, is there some horror scenes? Uh, and this is good for an interpretation, but actually we don't know how the algorithm is going to use these four uh, uh, characteristics. It's just some values that the training will build for us. But it's a good way to visualize how these values are built. And then when we have this vector that are not in two dimension, they will be in multi-dimensional space, the idea of the uh, dot product is the idea of comparing how much these two vectors are going in the same direction. And we will see that this idea of using vectors as bureau of information in machine learning is, is going farther and farther, and it's used a lot. A and it's, uh, it's interesting because a, a single num number can't describe really the complexity of, a, of, a, of, a, of some complex information of, uh, for example, how a movie is compared to another movie. Uh, so going farther, we start to have lots of different algorithms over the years with machine learning. And then someone starts to have an idea, say maybe I don't need to create a new one, I can just mix the algorithms that are already there and choose and pick uh, with some weights the output. And this is of other algorithms. This is the idea of ensemble. So traditionally, especially uh, between 2010 and 2015, we saw a lot of, uh, of use of ensembling. So we were not adding new algorithms, we were just bundling together older algorithms and finding a way to, to, to use them in a better way. And then someone went even farther with the concept of boosting. It say instead of mixing like a few good algorithms, what happens is I start mixing lots and lots of very weak learning system. And actually what happens is that you get good results. So if you start to mix up lots of weak prediction models, the final result is it, it starts to be good. And that's the idea of boosting. And this is XG boosting, one implementation of this algorithm. And the idea is that for uh, prediction, we build multiple trees. So for example, let's stay in the domain of item recommendation. I want to say uh, to know if uh, someone likes or not a specific item. Uh, I can create this very weak uh, prediction model that is a tree that say, okay, if you're younger, you probably like it more. If you're male, you probably like it more. And then I give a score. 
this is very weak, it doesn't work very well. So I can create another tree that says, for example, if you like computers, you use computers daily, then probably you like it more uh, or not. And then you can go on and add, and then when you receive a user, you can classify the user across all these different trees that can be hundreds of trees, and then you add up all the scores. And the prediction you get, it's called a tree ensemble this time, it's, it's, it's much better, it starts to be good. So this is a quite an interesting idea. But probably the reason why we are here and lots of people is interested in machine learning is because we've seen lots of advancement in uh, image classification. And that's uh, something that happened around 2012 with the explosion of convolutional networks. And those are probably the best algorithms for uh, uh, image classification from 2015, 2017. They all have very fancy names, so ResNet, DenseNet, Inception. And the idea is always to use these convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural networks work with different layers. This is a neural network. The first layer is a convolutional uh, layer that tries to extract features from an image, like there's a, there's a line, there's a circle. Uh, and then these features are passed to a pooling layer that will condense this information and pass the information to a next layer that will again start to look for features. This time, the second layer will look, and this we discovered this by analyzing the result, for more advanced features. I, I may look for an eye, a, a nose, a hand, and so on. And then we always do this pooling. But people realized over time that this pooling was losing information. So neural networks work very well with convolutions now, but we saw that there are limits, especially if you start to mix up, mix up things in the face. So if I move in a picture the mouth uh, uh, with an eye and I switch the eye with the mouth, most convolutional network will just see that everything is there because pooling is just dancing the information. They lose the localization of inside the picture. So that's why more recently there's been an interesting concept. It's called capsule networks. And the idea, guess what? It's not that you produce as an output uh, a number that you pass to uh, another layer, but the output is a vector, a bureau of information. And then you use dynamic routing. So you output of the capsule, the first capsule layer will output an, a vector, and then you will look on the receiving side for the next capsule that will align better with this vector, so they have the vector in the same direction. So you get dynamic routing, and I will pass this information to this new capsule. And then maybe another feature will create another vector, and this is passed to another capsule. So this concept of vectors and dynamic routing is creating lots of interest. We're really early stage now with capsule networks, but it's something that is in great development today as we speak. Another field that is really interesting is sequence to sequence. Uh, and here, for, uh, I mean a, a system where the input and the output is a sequence of tokens. It can be like an audio file, it can be a text file. And the three most common examples here are machine translation, so I give an input Italian and I get English, or vice versa. Uh, text summarization, I give an input a long text and I want to get a summary of the most relevant things inside this text. Or a speech to text, I give you an output, an input, uh, an audio file, and I want to understand the text inside this speech. And for sequence to sequence, we start to see deep neural networks being used starting from 2014. And that's the reason why we see devices like Amazon Alexa and the Amazon Echo, because we've improved a lot in speech recognition thanks to the, these platforms. They usually uh, use, like this is uh, Sokai, uh, an, open, an open toolkit that we released as Amazon uh, last year. Uh, it's using both recurrent neural networks and convolutional neural networks. So for convolutional neural networks are similar to the one before. Recurrent means that in the architecture of the network, it's not just feeding forward, but there are loops, so information can go back and forth inside the network. And normally, sequence to sequence is built with an encoder layer where you encode the information, like the input language uh, or uh, the voice. And then there is a decoder layer that will decode this information in the output language or uh, in a, in a, uh, create the summary of the text. And uh, the, the evolution that we've seen here, that we use also in Sokai, is the creation of a third layer in the middle that is called the attention layer, that is not purely field forward, but can have information go past and forth. Because the idea is that when you have a sequence of text, context is very important, because the same word can mean different things depending on the context. So the decoding layer can go back to the attention layer and get information on the context, and, and in this way you can uh, translate complex sentences into other languages. This is, uh, for example, 
a very basic translation. So uh, we see how, for example, uh, Grun is translated to green, so from, t from Dutch to, e to English. Uh, and this is quite ordered. But if we see this long sentence that you probably can't read from the back, uh, uh, what happens is that the, the syntax of the German language is different. So the word Sprechen, that is at the end of the German sentence, is at the, almost at the beginning of the translation in English as discuss, discussion. And uh, th uh, thanks to the attention layer, the neural network can go back and grab the information during the translation. If there was not this recurrent connection, you would not be able to do this kind of translation from one language to the other. With this, we leave the domain of supervised learning when we've seen lots of improvement over the years, and we enter into, uh, into unsupervised learning. So when we don't have levels of data, we really have data that we want to understand. And interestingly, we, uh, we, we don't have uh, lots of new developments. There are, there's a lot of research, but we don't have nothing skyrocketing in here. But we're using lots of old algorithms. For example, uh, key means has been developed in the 50s and the 60s. And the idea is to do clustering. So if I have lots of data points, I want to cluster these together and understand how they are distributed. This is something, for example, that lots of companies do to understand their customer. If you have one million of customers, you can't know each one uh, directly. So you can try to cluster them. And you don't have two dimensions. You have like hundreds of dimensions, all the information on your customer to understand if there are similar patterns so that you can understand who is maybe leaving the company, who is satisfied, who is could be interested to something that, that you have. And the idea of key means is really simple. So I, I love it. Is the idea is that you start with uh, defining k, so the number of clusters that you want. And then you can start with three centers for this k, uh, uh, for these centers. There's lots of optimization of on how to f start with the centers. But even if you start randomly, the algorithm usually converge. It's just lower in the conversion. Uh, and so we start with these three centers here, uh, green, orange, and blue. And then we assign each dot to the closest center. And that's just a simple iteration. And now that we have some uh, initial cluster, we can recompute the centers of each cluster. And the center will move. And now we iterate. We just reassign all the dots to the closest center. So a few dots will change color. And then we move the center again, recomputing the center, and so on. And at some point, the center will not move so much if it converge. And uh, you can define like an epsilon and, uh, and a number of iteration. And then you get the clustering of your data. So really simple, really powerful. This was invented before computers. So you can imagine people doing this by hand. Another unsupervised uh, category of uh, algorithms that is really interesting is dimensional reduction. So as I said, some data points like customers, they can have hundreds of informations. And sometimes too much information means that you can't compute anything because it's beyond your limits. And sometimes too much information means that you miss the really important data that, is in the, uh, that you have. So uh, dimensional reduction tries to solve that by finding the best information uh, to describe the best way to describe the information you have. So principal component analysis actually was developed uh, in 1901. So it's really old. And the idea is to find the important components in your dimensions uh, in the right order. So the first component will be the most important one. And uh, we will see something that we do every time without thinking. For example, let's look at these uh, dots here. So normally, I would describe these dots with x and y, and it's two points of information. But if I only tell you the, di the position compared to this uh, diagonal line, that is the principal component, I'm already giving you 80 90% of the information. The remaining distance from this line is much less important. And this is the principle of, uh, of PCA. And again, whenever you describe a point on a plane, you can just give the, 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 the where the point e is and then the altitude of the point. For example, when we describe the position of something on, on our planet, we use latitude and longitude. And then eventually, we add the altitude above or below the sea. We don't use it because normally you don't need it. It's much smaller compared to the information of latitude and longitude. So we use it always. We just don't think it. But this is a good way. So if you have lots of data, this is a good way to find the real important information in your data. And uh, still in the uh, unsupervised uh, learning models, uh, topic modeling is fascinating. It's been discovered twice. Once to use to find the important topics inside text. So if I give you lots of text information, like all the emails of your customer support, and you want to understand what are the most important topics that are discussed by your customer support, you can use these algorithms. 
The same algorithm was also developed actually originally for uh, uh, gen uh, genomics, so the analysis the analytics of our genetics data, and in this way to find recurrent patterns of, uh, uh, geno of genetic data inside our, our genomes. And in this way you can discover, for example, ancient migrations between population that we don't have any information right now. So the only way to find information on that, because it's so old, you can find that in our, in our DNA. So with topic modeling, let's do a very basic example of LDA. Let's imagine that you have a text, and the only words you use in this text are eat, sleep, play, mew, and bark. And then the output of the algorithm would be something like this. There's roughly two topics here. The first topic, the most relevant words, are sleep and mew. And for the second topic, the most relevant words are play and bark. So as human, we can understand that probably the first topic is talking about cats and the second topic is talking about dogs. This is not something that the algorithm will tell us. It will only tell us that there are two topics with those words, but it's already a lot of information. So a human is still required, but it's quite interesting. So if you have time, there are open source implementation. Try that with your personal or work emails and you can find what you're actually spending your time about. More recently, in 2015, we start to see neural networks being used here as well. Uh, and the interesting point here is that the output of neural networks is correct, but usually different from LDAs. So we get two different outputs, both good for the same problem. So what we can do as data scientists here? We can build an ensemble, as we said before. So we can mix and match and take the best from both algorithms. So this is how you can develop and improve in, in machine learning. Another uh, 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 point that is really interesting is time series forecasting. So when you have a uh, time series like the temperature on our planet, for example, or uh, the workload on your web servers, or how much an item is sold over time, uh, this is something that again was uh, very much implemented using statistics in the past. Now we've seen uh, neural networks being used as well. So this is, for example, DeepR, an algorithm that we developed and use internally in Amazon, and we made it available uh, uh, through this article. Uh, and the idea here is that you can build a single model that can go through different categories. And we're using recurrent neural networks here. Uh, the idea is that you predict something for one point in time and then the neural networks will send some information for the next iteration and then you predict another point in time. And from a time series, you can build uh, a prediction with a range that tells you that, for example, with 80% probability, you should stay within that range. And for example, I was talking with a customer, they are going to use this model together with a statistical approach and doing what? An ensemble so that this can be used to control the statistical model. If they get out of the 80% prediction here, with the statistical model, then probably they double check the data again. And the last algorithm I want to describe today is word to work. Uh, I said that with neural networks, we need to get in input text, for example, but to get in input things that are not numbers, it's not easy for a neural network. So that's the open problem of embedding. So how I can take information that is not numeric and put that into something that a neural network can understand. Usually the idea is to use dense ne uh, vector. And again, we use the same concept as we saw before. So vectors will be the bearer of information here. So we, we can create vectors that can tell us if two words are similar in meaning, they will be closer to each other. If they are different, they will go in different direction. And for example, here, you, the two use cases are either to predict a word from its context. So uh, uh, I know the context, and I want to understand what are the possible words that can be said. And this is something that we do continuously. When we talk to each other, we often don't understand everything that the other person is telling us. We miss some words sometimes. But our brain, transparently, depending on the context, we replace the word and fill these holes for us. And this is something that now we can do also with computers. So again, this is very important for speech recognition because if we don't understand something from the sound, maybe we can fill the, the void using this, uh, this approach. And the opposite is that from a single word, we can try to understand what is the, the context. And uh, again, as I said, you have, you have to imagine these points in multiple dimensions. Each point uh, represents a, 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 a single word, it's actually a vector. And if they are closer to each other, they are related. So probably cappuccino and espresso are very close to each other. Then tea and croissant or cornetto in Italy will be a little bit farther away, but still tied together by the, the concept of breakfast. And then other words will be farther and farther away. So 
we uh, release, for example, an implementation of Blazin text because the problem of Word 2 x is how fast you can compute this, uh, this, uh, these vectors. Uh, you need to compute, for example, millions of words per second if you need to process lots of information. And in machine learning, another problem is, okay, I have lots of algorithms, but are they really usable on the amount of data that I have? We have customers that process large amounts of data. So customers pro can process terabytes of data every day. They can build millions of predictions every second. Or they can rebuild their model every day, and they have one hour to rebuild their model. Otherwise, they start to miss the, 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 the business expectation. So how can you do that? Well, normally in machine learning, you have your data, you feed it to the learning server, and then where the algorithm is running, and then you get the, the prediction model. If you have lots of data, you need to scale horizontally. Otherwise, this will not work, because you will reach a bottleneck. And uh, even worse, I, I, mo lots of models, all the models that we saw, they have lots of configuration parameters. They are called hyperparameters. And you need to, if you change these parameters, you get from a training a different result. So often you need to repeat the training multiple times just to play with these parameters and see which is the best output. And uh, another problem is incremental training. Uh, let's say that I train my prediction on the last two months of data that I have, then another month pass, and usually uh, what I do, I drop one month and I take a new month of data and I retrain my algorithm. And that's what lots of customers are doing. So in Amazon, we start to think about a different approach. What if we think of uh, this uh, training algorithms as streaming? So there is a continuous stream of data. We keep the state of this training algorithm, but we don't stop learning at any point. So we, have a, we expect a continuous stream of data. And if we work in this way, streaming is infinitely scalable because at any point in time, we have a finite amount of data to process, so the memory we need is limited, is capped. And also, our processing time and cost will grow linearly with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the amount of data that we have. So if I double the time, the, the data that I have, I either double the time or I double the cost if I can scale horizontally. So with incremental training, uh, it's much better with streaming because if I want to add a new month, I don't need to retrain everything. I just add my new month to the stream of data. And uh, if we add support for GPU and CPU, for example, we can start to scale horizontally and add a shared state so that we can process algorithms that needs to communicate across different boxes. And the idea is that in the state, we can pu put more information than just the model. For example, we can put metadata information on the hyperparameters. And in this way, model selection is not requiring you to retrain the model with different parameters, but you can just take this augmented state and test very quickly the output of changing the configuration to see if you get different models and which is one is better. So we built this. Uh, we use uh, containers so that it was easy to extend, and it's called Amazon SageMaker. It's a tool that we created last year. Uh, it has a visual interface using Jupyter Notebook. Uh, you can use it to do a distributed training on one or more systems. There's virtually no limit using CPU or GPUs. And then the output of the model can be hosted as an API that is automatically scalable. So you can do one prediction per month or 1,000 predictions per second. It, it, we can handle that. With SageMaker, we give you access to all those algorithms that I described before as built-in, and then you can use your familiar tools. So you can use TensorFlow, Apache MXNet, PyTorch, Cafe, Torch, and we also give you access to high-level interfaces just such as Keras and Gluon. Gluon is a project that Amazon is working together with Microsoft to create a simple interface for machine learning. And we released at open source the containers we use for TensorFlow, MXNet, a sample container where you can add your own algorithms and the integration with Spark and a Python SDK so that you can integrate this with your own applications. And for example, this is Music Match. It's uh, an app that can help you follow the lyrics on your phone. They were at our summit in Milan and they share they had this idea. So normally music recommendations are done based on what other people is doing. So if you listen to this song, other people that listen to this song likes this other music. They said, if you're a Music Match user, you're interested in lyrics because you want to see the lyrics. So maybe I can use the lyrics as a database to build recommendations. So if you like these lyrics, probably you like this song that maybe has a completely different sound but similar lyrics. And it's a new idea that they're building with SageMaker. 
And with SageMaker, you can deploy the model also on an Internet of Things device, such as a Raspberry Pi, an Intel Atom, uh, an NVIDIA Jetson board. And the idea is that you can deploy the model at south of the cloud, close to where you need it, at low latency and low ba uh, a very fast bandwidth. And for example, uh, still in Milan, there was Vodafone, and they show us this proof of concept they did live, actually, in the summit. And uh, this is something they built uh, together with us for the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. And they said there's lots of solutions for driver monitoring to see if the driver of a car is doing something risky. For example, you're falling asleep and then maybe the car is telling you don't sleep, <laughs> stay, stay, wake up. Another risky thing that you can do is use the smartphone while you are driving. But putting a machine learning model inside a car is difficult to manage. So what they did, uh, uh, so what we did with Vodafone is to deliver the model on the edge of the mobile network, so very close to the car, not on the internet. So the car has just a, a camera sending pictures to the edge of the mobile network, and then they can check if uh, some dangerous behavior is happening, and then can send very quickly a signal back to the car. And in this way, they can continuously update the model and make it faster. Think, for example, cars usually they live more than 10 years, but 10 years ago, smartphones are quite different different from what we have today, so you need to update this model uh, to ad adjust the human behavior. So uh, just to finish, machine learning, I think, is really algorithms plus data and tools. So as AWS, we are trying to provide you the best tools. The data will probably depend on, uh, on the company, the business, the idea that you have. So where can you focus? I think that and then the, there is really the algorithm where you should focus. And this is what we saw today. Just a quick recap. If you're interested, don't be scared of technical articles. Even if you're not into mathematics, most technical articles on machine learning, they have an introduction, an abstract, and a conclusion section that is very easy to read. So don't be scared and try to learn more. I think it's really an interesting topic. Thank you. Let me know if there is any question. You can, of course, ask questions in Italian. <laughs> we have a question here. Okay. Um, I just want to know if uh, it's possible to, to use an image classification time series. Uh, do you have an, a use case in your mind? So uh, technically, yes, so you can chain. So for example, you can do image classification on data uh, and do that every second or every minute, and then this output can be provided for a time series. It's uh, definitely possible. Uh, my, use my use case is uh, my client, uh, uh, my committer, sorry, um, analyze time series or some uh, behavior or some uh, mechanical uh, um, uh, component. Um, I don't know how to do uh, machine learning on time series. I'm studying now. But uh, follow some courses, I see that um, I can try to comparise uh, the, um, the behavior of the, uh, the, di or the graph uh, like an image in classification. Uh, just, uh, so you want to apply the, the image analysis to the output graphics of a time series? Yeah. Wow, uh, that, that's, that's quite interesting. Yeah, you, you, you can do that. I don't know if you need to rebuild the image, no? because normally we have the problem of, the, of transforming the image in a numeric format. So in that case, probably you already have the time series. So probably you don't need to go back to the image, but you can still analyze the patterns that okay. the graph is designed, definitely. And we can take this offline, and I'm really interested. Thank you. Is there any other question? No question? I can accept English and Italian. <laughs> A little bit of French. Nothing. Okay, so I'm available here if you need anything, and thanks for staying.